few protocols before I start. First and foremost, please say hello to my pimple. Kind of visited me like two days ago and I don't know when Pimpelina is going to be going away. Dr. Pimple Popper. Secondly, I'm on Facebook Live recording this. Um, so I need to just give a warning that in the past, Facebook has kind of throttled some of my streaming. And sometimes it, it becomes so disruptive that I end up having to end the streaming. So I'm going to give this a shot. If it becomes unbearable and I do get cut off a lot of times, I'm going to unfortunately have to switch off um, this live stream. I think that's what's important. Number two, three, when it comes to protocol, I do not have all the information. Um, when I do finally upload this on my YouTube channel, Penuel the Black Pen, I'm going to try and put all the links of all the things that I'm speaking about in the description, uh, maybe in the comments as well. And as I post this on Facebook, I'm going to put the links in my in my comments. But you guys can can try and research some of these things yourselves. A story that's currently trending is the story of Utabo Besta, you know, a convicted Facebook rapist is what he was called because he raped two ladies that he lured via Facebook and social media. And there was a story of him murdering his wife. I think she, Uchulu is her surname. She may have been in Cape Town uh, or they were based in, in the Cape at that time. The major story that's currently trending is the fact that last year it was reported that Utabo Besta uh, burnt alive, got burnt and died in prison in Mangawung in the Free State. Um, later on, there were people sending emails to the Correctional Services Spaces. Uh, there were people on social media that claimed that they had seen him. Um, and it would take now, almost a year later, for the Correctional Services and for the police to finally act and to go and do the research and actually confirm that the body that was found dead in the prison was not that of Tabo Besta. The DNA evidence has now concluded that definitively. Frenzy in the country, a frenzy for those that are following the story. Um, those that had seen the episode of Podcast and Chill with Mac G and Saul uh, heard the story of how they, someone had called in, someone that had been tweeting the whole of last year, stating that Tabo Besta was not dead, called in and confirmed that he was a prisoner in prison, calling them from prison um, and confirming some of the names, high-profile names of people involved in the escape of Tabo Besta. There's a news clip from Newsroom Africa that's going to be one of the links I'm going to post, where the, 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 the news person, news journalist, Michelle, here's her name, I'm not sure of her surname, is speaking to someone from Ground Up, which does investigative journalism. Um, Oliver Meth is the name. I'm guessing it's a pseudonym. It's, it's a fake name, basically. And they're giving the details of how from last year they've been doing research and trying to speak to correctional services, to the South African police services and other people involved to try and follow up on this matter. And to date, they are not forthcoming in terms of wanting to collect the evidence they've collected um, and, and seen. They're not forthcoming in telling them exactly where to go with this stuff so that they can follow up on it. And it's only now because of public pressure, thanks to social media, thanks to Twitter, thanks to platforms like Facebook and YouTube, that now they almost have no choice but to investigate some of these matters. But Ground Up has done a lot of amazing work, which is kind of really, really scary. Um, but shout out to Oliver Meth and the entire team. You know, there's going to be reports that are going to be coming out. What Oliver Meth did uh, allude to is that there are senior officials at correctional services that are implicated in the Tabo Besta escape. There are two high-ranking political officials um, in, in society that are linked, that apparently Tabo Besta was bankrolling, you know, in living a lavish life in prison. There's a very scandalous story of how he was um, streaming live from prison at an event, I think at the Hilton Hotel in Santon, where he claimed to be a Tom Mutsipe, who is this multimillionaire who was in New York at the time, and the attendees of this thing, um, of a company that he claimed was Century Media, 21st Century Media, uh, they even sang happy birthday for him while he was in prison, dressed in a shirt and a tie, appearing to be a businessman in New York, all the while streaming in prison. And how he ran these elaborate schemes where a lot of investors put money in and that money was stolen. Um, a lot of that money was renting properties in the Sandown area in Cape, in, in, in Santon in Johannesburg and also in the Hyde Park area in Johannesburg. And I'm not creating any links, but for people that don't know, 
President of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, lives in Hyde Park, on the cusp of Hyde Park and Sandhurst. And Julius Malima, the leader of the Economic Freedom Fighter, also has a house in Hyde Park, which people have linked to Adriano Mazzotti, who is one of the funders and one of the people that funded the, the start-up of the EFF. I'm getting disturbances. There are calls from Cape Town trying to come through. I'm not sure what's happening. Like I said, I get, I get interrupted generally on Facebook, and I apologize for that. I hope the calls won't keep coming in. Um, what I was saying, basically, is that the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, lives in Hyde Park, on the cusp of Hyde Park and Sandhurst, and the leader of the economic freedom fighters, Julius Malima, lives in Hyde Park as well, uh, a house that has been linked to one of the funders of the EFF, Adriano Mazzotti, um, whose daughter, I believe, was getting married in Ibiza, um, where Julius Malima had gone to that wedding as well. Um, I hope that's not why it was being interrupted, um, this video that I'm, I'm sending now. Um, so, Tabo Pesta, under the name, I think, of Katlejo Nguana, a fake name, had been renting these properties with the aid of a lady that identified herself as his customary wife um, when he allegedly died in the prison in Mangawong, Dr. Nandipa, um, what's her surname? Mangaduma, Manga, Makadumane, Makadumana, something along those lines. You can you can research it, Doctor Nandipa. Apparently, she was on podcast and chill last year as well. Apparently, she's an aesthetics doctor, and a lot of people are having a lot of question marks around her name uh, and around her profile. I think she's got two children, where she was apparently living with her so-called husband, this uh, Katle Hongwana, who people are saying now is Tabo Pesta who escaped last year, and it's thanks to people who apparently had taken photos of Dr. Nandipa as fans of her, seeing her with this gentleman who looks like Utabo Pesta, that some of these stories had been trending. It's been trending for the past couple of weeks. Dr. Nandipa has been trending for the past couple of weeks. And the story is just scary. It's heartbreaking. It, it leads to the questioning of the credibility of our correctional services, the questioning of the credibility of our politicians, um, the questioning of so much that's happening in this country and that is being highlighted and the failure of normal investigative journalists who seem to not be doing their job, the failure of the police services. A lot of these cases that are going out are no longer being pushed by the police. If you look at the recent assassination and the killing of Kenan Forbes, known as AKA and Tibbs Mutwane, uh, Tibello, you know, in, in Durban, in Florida Road. A lot of the pushing has been coming from the video footage that leaked where some social media people, including Klamulo Baloi, Unota, asked very pertinent questions. And I went and I watched the conversation with the, or the interview by Annika Larson on ENCA with Anwar Dog Khan, who was the bodyguard of, of Ken and Forbes when he was in KZN, speaking about some of the protocol that was breached around what happened in Durban, speaking about how he should not have gone to where he went in Florida Road, and the rise of private security in this country and how so many people are now using bodyguards, etc. And Udog Khan basically is saying that rich people are aware that poor people are struggling and are desperate. And they know that as poor people become desperate, rich people become a target. And because they do not believe in the police services, they then look to private security and bodyguards and the like. One of the things that perturbed me and disturbed me was the prison that Tabo Pesta allegedly escaped from is managed and controlled and operated and the admin is done by G4S, a private security company. You may have seen their trucks. They do cash in transit movements, G4S. And according to Ground Up and Oliver Meth, G4S, their relationship with correctional services had soured. And that's why the reports and to, and to the unnatural death of the so-called prisoner being Tabo Pesta at the time, there was the report took longer than it was supposed to. It took 10 months. And it seems the push did come from the public. Number one, I know I've done this research before, but I'm not aware of how many of our uh, correctional services, what we know as prisons or jails, are actually controlled and maintained by private companies. In America, I'd like to think a big chunk of them, if not almost all of them, if not all of them, are run by private companies. There's a very scandalous story um, which came out in America. Two judges, I think, Mark... Um, C Ciara Vela, I think, and a Mike something else. Again, I'm going to put the links in the comments and in the description when you watch this. Of these two judges that were being given bribes, essentially paid, I think, $2.8 million. 
they eventually had to, there were fine penalties of over $200 million, but they were paid $2.8 million by these private prison owners to try and push children, juveniles into their prison facilities so they can make money. You know, and I remember at the time researching, do we have privately owned security, uh, pri prisons in this country? Because they have an incentive. It's almost like a funeral parlor. A funeral parlor needs people to die in order for them to make money. When people are healthy and not dying, it wouldn't be scary to find out that funeral parlors are pushing for people to die out there in various ways so that they can cash up in terms of their funeral businesses along with the money that they collect as well. So there would be an incentive for people that own prisons to be able to then say, we need more people jailed and we need people to push for that. I never found that information, but finding out what's happening with G4S was a bit disturbing for me. And it would be interesting for us to actually find out how many of our prisons are privately owned, how many of our prisons are controlled and, and operated by private businesses who have an incentive for that. It was a very scary uh, article that I, that I bumped into a couple of years ago. And when I bumped into it, I bumped into this article because, because of an amazing documentary um, that was done by Ava DuVernay. Ava DuVernay is an African-American woman, the first African-American woman to have a budget of over $100 million, you know, for a blockbuster movie being, I think, A Wrinkle in Time with Oprah Winfrey. She's a friend of Oprah Winfrey. She's an amazing producer, director, um, screenwriter, um, etc. She did a story called When They See Us about the Central Park jogger who was, I think, apparently killed. And these boys that were erroneously jailed and forced you know, in weird ways to kind of admit to a crime they didn't commit. Very disturbing miniseries, if you ever get a chance to watch it, When They See Us, had a lot of people traumatized. Another documentary on Netflix, which they've also put on YouTube, is the documentary 13th, 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 which was nominated as well. And 13th speaks about the racket of prisons in America, the 13th Amendment, which was abolished under slavery, which means people couldn't be treated like slaves anymore, but how there was a loophole in how prisoners can still be treated like slaves in America and the disproportionate number of black American prisoners, the disproportionate number of Latin American prisoners in the prisons and how a lot of them are used for labor and how a lot of them are forced to basically concede to crimes they didn't commit. There's another movie, I think, with Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan. I've just forgotten the name by now, but you can go and look that up as well. I'll put the name in the in the description. And this movie speaks about how this movie, the documentary, the When They See Us uh, miniseries, speaks about how in America, I'm sure something similar happens in South Africa, these cases that are settled out of court, how you, a prisoner or a, a person that's charged is told, if you go to trial and you lose, you might get a maximum sentence of 25 years. People don't know in South Africa, generally what we call a life sentence is 25 years. It's not for life, but it's 25 years before parole, which means you're eligible to be released for good behavior rehabilitation. Of course, if you don't get parole, you get to stay for longer. But essentially, life in South Africa is deemed 25 years and not necessarily for the rest of your life, as someone may, may think. But anyways, settling out of court. So if you go to trial and you lose you may serve the maximum 25 years as an example. And they say, if you settle out of court, that means you have to plead guilty. I can speak to the other lawyer and we can maybe get you a settled sentence of maybe five years, um, of, of which some of two of them, maybe you get to serve at home, maybe you get to do community service. And someone who is scared, petrified, who does not understand the law, who is poor, who maybe has really poor legal representation, might be told, take the deal. Plead guilt, but I didn't do it. Yes, but take the deal. Otherwise, you may spend 25 years, so it's your choice. And they get coerced into serving. And how people like Bill Clinton, people like Hillary Clinton, other politicians in America have used these laws to oppress and exploit and bully, you know, especially black Americans and especially Latin Americans um, in America. 13th, please go check it out. And you try and think of what that would mean in a South African case. So our prisons largely are state-owned. So you'd be like, well, they're not for profit. But those prisons are serviced by private businesses. If you look at our government, you know, the biggest tenderpreneurs are private companies. And I've mentioned these names on other platforms before. So the same with our prisons. The food that they get, they get fed. The uniforms that they use. 
uh, maybe some of the cleaning services, some of the sometimes the police and the and the prisons have private security that monitor there. Those are private companies, and those companies can only make money if there are prisoners there, people that do the gardening and all those kind of things there, and the jobs, you know, the prison warders, the people that cook, etc. Those people need prisoners, otherwise they don't have money. And the last I've checked, our our prisons in South Africa are over they overfilled. Nelson Mandela's done it. I think Jacob Zuma's done it. Where at some point they've they've released prisoners to say, look, we're full. If you're on good behavior, if you don't have a, a heavy sentence, we will release you as a gift. I think Nelson Mandela would do something like that on his birthday, which a lot of people took huge offense to. Why would you release these people? But we also at some point have to speak about the concept of correctional services and the supposed rehabilitation that doesn't really happen. You know, some of the, the, the scary things that are coming out now with some of the prisons, especially the one in Mangaung, is the idea that certain prisoners were being drugged. You know, we've been given certain meds so they hallucinate. So they say things that are incoherent. You know, the abuse, we've heard stories of prisoners that get raped by other prisoners. And we've heard stories of prisoners that get raped by some of the wardens. We've heard stories of wardens falling pregnant with prisoners' children. We've heard of female prisoners falling pregnant with the children of warders, male warders. So there's huge crimes. You know, if you watch an amazing channel called the Agenda Network, you know, you can see some of their videos on Facebook can see some of their videos on YouTube. The Agenda Network has these ex-convicts that speak about some of the atrocities that happen in prison, um, some of the scandals there and how dark prison is. And this space that is almost shielded from the world, you almost want to put video cameras in the prisons and monitor the behavior there by the prisoners themselves and by the, the wardens so that people can see exactly what's happening. If these people have committed crimes, of course they should lose some of their rights, but then there should be surveillance to make sure that there aren't more atrocities happening in there and that some of the more hectic things, places like Paulsmore Prison, you know, that were uncovered in documentaries by the BBC, I think, some of those things get exposed because there are people that are meant to be fixing society that are fully embroiled in some of the damage that is happening even to prisoners. And the idea that all prisoners are lumped in this one place and prisons and, and, and crimes are not the same. You've got a serial murderer and serial rapist that is being imprisoned with a woman who stole formula and nappies, you know, uh, for her child because she's poor, because she's struggling, because of the socioeconomic situation we have in South Africa, thanks to apartheid, thanks to colonization, and thanks to a corrupt black government today. So there are private companies that benefit from even state-owned prisons in this country. But these are conversations we need to have. As social media becomes more influential and more powerful, as voices like mine become influential, as platforms such as podcasts and vodcasts, expose certain things that people would not have, have seen or heard where mainstream media was falling short, where people are using their cell phones to capture footage that journalism has seen to, to, to fall short of. We find ourselves in a very weird space where citizens now almost definitely have to take the matter and the law into their own hands. I have said <coughs> I'm one of the people that supports private citizen gun ownership. We don't have enough police. Some of the police are underpaid, they feel, and they end up taking bribes because they feel they, they can't survive with their salaries. Some of them take bribes from criminals. Andre Tareta, the now ex-CEO of ESCOM, spoke about people that they arrested that were released. There are so many stories of the prison systems releasing prisoners. Now, Tabo Besta living lavish. Politicians that are involved. Upegitele, for example, is seen at certain strategic crime spaces but not at others. Cyril Ramaphosa with some of these things is constantly absent. You have to ask whose agendas are they serving and it, it's up to us the citizens now, even with the, the, the riots and the looting in 2021, where citizens had to take arms, where the taxi industry had to come in, where it, it's becoming fundamentally important because our police are corrupt, our politicians are corrupt, and there are so many criminals and thugs working with these people that it's, it's almost now stupid to not have your own guns in your own home. It's stupid in your neighborhood to not have community policing and some type of neighborhood watch. It's silly now for family to not say, can we get lawyers to come and school us on the law? What's right and what's wrong? Can we start maybe raising money to tell the police, to tell some of these traffic cops to be like, you guys have to serve us. And if you don't, we will come after you. We've heard stories of police being killed in South Africa. And we normally mourn 
But you don't know that some of those police that are killed are corrupt police that are killed by their friends who are criminals or killed by good citizens who are saying, but you guys are working with the, the, the drug lords. Places like Westbury, I've, I've heard stories of, of the police involved uh, with some of the criminals and the drug dealers there. You know, Lanasia, uh, Ennerdale in those areas, in the Western Cape, there's some of those stories of extortion and some of the private security there is, is not working for the benefits of the community, but for the benefits of the, of the drug dealers there. Those are things that are happening. Those are things you can read articles on. So now we're left having to kind of take care of ourselves. We're left trying to think, can we study the law? And is this law even fair? Chief Justice Raymond Zondo with the Zondo Commission is being given all this evidence by Brian Molife, Matsila Koko, um, uh, Lucky Montana, and other people, and he doesn't act on it. Instead, he gets given a, a, a chief justice role, but the same president, Cyril Ramaphosa, implicated with Glencore in the State Capture Commission. So our courts are captured, our judges are captured, our politicians are captured, and by captured by, by money, and they're captured by criminals with money, and they themselves start looking like criminals. You know, Didi Mabuz has been linked to some of the stuff that's happened in Pumalanga with the coal mines, with the suppliers of ESCOM. Something has to change. Something has to change, and it's becoming extremely scary. Luckily, we have our cell phones, social media, the internet, but more and more of you are going to need to get guns. Licensed guns, of course, where you can. Some of you are going to need to start learning the law, learning what's right and what's wrong, and what rights even a police officer has coming to you. To tell them, I have a right to know your name. I have a right to know your number and which station you represent. I have a right to film you. You can't tell me that I shouldn't film you. Yes, I may not obstruct the, the, the rolling out of justice, but I, I have a fundamental right to film you with my camera and to send this footage somewhere. You have a right to follow me. The number of cops I've had to encounter and deal with, the number of magistrates I've spoke to that do not know the law is absolutely shocking. And that's when an advocate, Dalim Pofu, that's when a Tembega Nogai Tobi, that's when a Barry Rue, a Harinel, they challenge judges all the way to the Constitutional Court, the Supreme Court of Appeal. They challenge other lawyers because they realize, no, Your Honor, but you are misreading the law. That lawyer does not understand the law. These are high senior advocates. So can you imagine in the ways down, all the way down to normal cops, ordinary people you went to school with that didn't get good marks and they ended up becoming traffic cops or police officers just to earn a living and their lack of understanding of the law that we have out there. It is absolutely shocking and scary. Ronald Lamula, the Minister of Justice now, is being exposed for being biased in certain things. We are still not getting clarity on the Guptas. Are they in Dubai? Are they not? Are they going to be extradited? If they get extradited, what case does the South African government have against these people? How can they definitively say, here's the evidence. These guys are wanted, they are criminals. Or are they still going to bring them and question them and try and find something? Cyril Ramaphosa with Palapala, money stuffed in couches. It is fundamentally embarrassing that millions of dollars, foreign currency that should not be held by an individual, is stuffed in couches by a so-called billionaire president. In couches, not in a safe, money that was seemingly not declared, but the South African Revenue Services is clearing that. So they are implicit in some way and they are captured. The Reserve Bank in some or other way. We saw Al-Bashir from Sudan, who apparently is an international criminal, came into South Africa, left, and the ANC and other people turned a blind eye. How many blind eyes do they turn? We're not saying they must arrest Al-Bashir. That's Western propaganda. That's the ICC, the International Criminal Court. It's whatever. But what about criminals that oppress and, 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 and are bad for the South African citizens? What about our borders that are porous and where people come in and out? What about this, this documentary now by Al Jazeera of the gold mafia? How much money is illegally being smuggled in and out of South Africa? What was being smuggled in and out with Palapala that we don't know? How many of our politicians have cash money sitting in their homes, are being bribed? We don't know. We live in a criminal mafia thug state. But I want to say this. In my view, almost all governments are run by criminals. Almost all of them. America. Uh, Europe, Germany, the United Kingdom, Asia, China, etc., run by criminals. The difference is the decorum and the seemingly respect of the rule of law. What do I mean by that? Tabo Pesta, it comes out 
may have escaped prison. Beggy Kaili, because this is a big story, comes out and he speaks and he says, we have heard about the story of Tabo Best. I will make sure that my best men are on the case. He may be lying, but it sounds like he's doing something. Very soon, they have a lead. Very soon, they have suspects. They've arrested five people. These may be four people that have been paid. It could be prisoners that have been artificially released to be prisoned again so that they pay to be like, you guys will be the four guys to say that you helped this guy. Just so that it seems to us, the public, that he is doing something. These guys get convicted. They confess. Jailed. Same thing with, with AKA and Tebes and the murder. Get prisoners to say, we did it. We were released. This is what happened. Get a full guy, even as a warrior, to say, yes, I helped him out. And all of a sudden, we are seeing the police commissioner, the minister of police, saying, this guy, he cracks the whip. Sil Ramaphosa gets on a platform. He says, we've seen what's happened with the borders. I've gotten my best guys at immigration with Minister Arun Mutualedi. We are making sure that all these people are jailed. They jail some Zimbabweans. They jail some Mozambicans. These, again, could be criminals who they've paid to say, look, you guys will be the full guys. And we're like, ooh, our government is hard at work. That's what America does well. That's what Europe does well. That's what China does well. Even when there are crimes and they are involved and implicit in the crimes, they keep this decorum where the ordinary citizen sees them as acting. In South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa turns a blind eye. He never responds to questions. He does not field questions. Peggy Tele, Fili Mbalula crack jokes. Ronald Lamula doesn't give us a sense of justice in this country. There is rampant corruption. People are being exposed. Ground Up is saying we have evidence, but no one at SAPS and other people is coming to us. When we've been trying to say, guys, we have evidence, they are not coming to receive this evidence, which means they are not interested in justice. And they're not even interested to make it seem like they want to be interested in justice. And we are left alone. Saul and Magji decided to not release the phone call because they said hi. Uh, profile individuals were, were implicated. If we had a functional police service and investigative arms, they would immediately subpoena those that, that recording and say, you guys have claimed that this might be something that would lead to a case to the arrest of Tabo Pesta. We will subpoena because this is evidence that we need. We will follow up to find out who exactly is this prisoner. Why do prisoners have cell phones and have access to Twitter and the like? We must follow up on that immediately, but they're not doing it. So that should be subpoenaed, but it's, it's, it's happening, it's not happening, we don't know. We don't know if they will have to testify about what they had to see there. The guys at Ground Up said that, as far as they were concerned, this was from a few days ago, there is no warrant of arrest for Tabo Pesta, even though it's been confirmed that Tabo Pesta is not the body of the person that died in the Mangaung prison. There's no warrant of arrest for Tabo Pesta, as far as they were concerned. The ports and the harbors, the, airplay, the, the, the flights, the uh, air... Um, International airports, the harbors with the ships, uh, some of the borders going into some of the SADC regions. None of them have been alerted. Please, please be on the lookout for this guy. He is a wanted man. What would Dr. Nandipa, his supposed wife, or whatever the case may be. We have no justice system. We have no cops. The fact that Ch Tabo Besta has got four passports, as far as they know, at a minimum, means there is a rot at home affairs under Minister Arun Mutualid. Before that, I think it was Malusi Kikaba. Before that, it was Ngozasa Nalamini Zuma. There are illegal immigrants in this country that have passports, that have IDs. Where did they get them from? There are illegal immigrants coming in and out of our borders because there's corruption there. We have borders. Afri Forum has done a documentary. If you go onto their pages, they've got this documentary about how there are no fences. The people literally just cross a river or they just walk. Places like Lesotho, if you look at the Free State, if you look at the Eastern Cape, if you look at parts of KZN, from Lesotho, there's people that just walk. And then you, and then you expect justice. While Cyril Ramaphosa, they grandstand with international people and they pretend like they have this country on lock. South Africa is a shambles of a nation and the reality is this country is a second-hand country. Manufacturing, farming, mining to benefit America, the United States of America, Canada, to benefit the United Kingdom, Britain in particular, to benefit um, the European nations in particular, Germany, France, um, Spain, uh, Italy, um, to benefit places like Russia, to benefit Asia in particular, China, uh, South Korea, Japan, places like India. We are glorified workers. We wake up every day and we, we get exploited as farm workers to export there. 
We had exploited as miners to send our highest grade coal to Europe to power their industries, to America, to Asia, to power their industries. We, we buy from their businesses that are here, the American businesses, the European businesses, the Asian businesses, to make sure they have jobs, to make sure they are rich while we are being destroyed here. And your politicians are funded by these people. Your politicians work for these people. When they go to the United Nations, when they go to the World Economic Forum, they are going to report to the real masters what's happening in that country. King Charles, Joe Biden, Vladimir Putin. I think, I don't know if Chancellor Merkel is still in Germany. Uh, Xi Jinping, the Prime Minister of India. All these people need to get reports of what is South Africa doing for us. And if it's not in their interest, Tabo Besta, rampant rapes, femicide, the Cape gangs and the violence, some of the drug guys in Bedford View and the east of Joburg, um, poverty, they're not going to be involved. They will be involved when the mines are being attacked. That's when they ask Sil Ramaphosa to intervene with London, Mi London Mining, Lonman, and he asks for concomitant action. That's when some of the Australian mines that operate in Pumalang are saying, what's going on there? Send security forces. We need to find out what's going on because those are our mines. That's our money. Those are our farms. Send security to patrol there. Those are our politicians. Go protect them. We need them in blue lights. We need them with private uh, security and bodyguards. That's their interest. They don't care about the people here, about the rampant poverty, about the illegal immigrants. If anything, they support illegal immigrants because their intel on the ground has told them as long as we've got illegal people from Lesotho, Mozambique, Eswatini, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, Malawi, and other places, as long as we have them, we can exploit them for cheap labor. We don't have to pay them anything because they're not tracked. They're not part of any labor union which will fight for their rights. We can exploit them. And we can take some of the, the commodities and the minerals from Amazama Zama, the illegal miners, and we can buy them in a black market and sell, buy it for peanuts and then sell it at a premium and put it together with some of the commodities that we mine legally. That is a criminal state that we're in. And many people are still naive, ignorant about our constitution, the greatest constitution in the world. This constitution does not serve Africans and black people in particular. It serves the agendas of the incumbent wealthy that came here, including the families of a friend of mine, very good friend of mine, Rob Hersoff. The benefits they got from the apartheid regime, from colonization, the Manal family, the Oppenheimers, today the Mutsipes, the Ramaphosas, some of the black elites that have been co-opted into the mining and manufacturing and farming elites in this country and on the continent. Wealthy people around the world, for the masses, you're not important. It doesn't matter if you die. It doesn't matter if you're poor. If you start rising up, they will give you a pacifier, a, a dummy, in the form of a grant, 350 rand, in the form of a free matchbox house and RTP, in the form of free medication, which you constantly need to be on which enriches certain tenderpreneurs. But fundamentally, your rights, they don't care about, they don't want you to be rich and well off. If you look at what's happened in Zimbabwe with the ravaging of that country, if you look at what's still happening in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, all the way back from the days of King Leopold, when it was called Zaire, absolutely atrocious, Sudan, Nigeria, no one cares. And certain days I tweet, I, I post this, certain days I ask myself, why should I care about the masses? Especially in this country of South Africa, because the black masses are hooked up on We Are Jola 99 and Mocha Love and Soapies on SAPC1, on stories that play on Ukozi FM and, and Kuala Kuala, Tobela. They hooked on toxic social media, laughing, looking at dance challenges. They hooked on booze. They hooked on hublies and nyaupe and, and, and weed, which they say, oh, weed is good for you. They hooked on junk food. They refused to exercise. They hooked on, on casual, unprotected, unnecessary sex. I've got six children, four mothers, planned children. Can judge me all you want. It's fine. But my children are planned. But you're going to hide your skeletons of abortions, of miscarriages, of morning after pills. Of that random night you got so drunk and you went home with some guy, you don't even remember his name, and then you took the morning after. You're not going to hide that. And you're going to judge me and have a, a, a moral high ground. My six children were planned with their mothers. We had conversations. I love children. I want to have children. 
The mothers of my children are mature, independent women who work. It's not random girls I fucked in a toilet somewhere. I get judged. But you guys are engaging in casual sex somewhere drunk. It's girls' night. No one will police my body. Don't tell me. But you're on contraceptives. You've got an implant. You've got the patch. You've got the loop. You pop a pill. You're injected. And you have a moral high ground because you don't have kids. But you won't realize at age 35, 40, you're infertile. You can't have kids. Now you're desperate. Now it's a sad story. You're trying to freeze your eggs, but you don't even know that process. Now you're trying to do artificial, uh, in vitro uh, in, in, uh, fertilization, IVF. But you don't know how expensive that is and that it's got a 33% chance of success. It's tragic now. You are granny. You're old. You and your men that you were so superior and high for. My point is this. The masses of this country are plugged into bullshit and they keep voting for a corrupt ANC and they keep voting for an EFF which has been sent to calm them down and not necessarily to get them land, to get them into mining, to get them to farm. That is going to overhaul our education system so that a child in grade 1, in grade 7, in grade 11 is learning how to grow food in soil, learning, going to school and planting foods and learning about seeds so that that child can feed themselves and their families. No, that child must go buy from the shops because those business owners fund the EFF, the DA, the ANC, etc. No, don't teach people how to grow their own food. People are being kept away from weapons so that it's only the government that has weapons and the army and the police and it's only oh, the taxi mafia and it's only the drug dealers and it's only the politicians and their business friends that have guns. The ordinary citizen must never have a gun. Guns are bad for you. Guns are dangerous. They kill people. They kill people when it's them that are doing it. You're not teaching children. Shout out to the Afrikaners. Shout out, shout out to some of the Indian Muslims in South Africa that are sending children to the shooting range, learning how to use guns and to protect themselves. Things you should be learning at school. Kids are not being taught how to manufacture things. Going to school, they've collapsed um, subjects such as woodwork. Teaching a child how to chop down a tree, take that tree and turn it into a bench, turn it into a bed. Learning things like fitting and turning, plumbing, working with, with steel and metal at school. Children that should be learning how to basic electrical work in their homes. Learning how to work with tools. Crushing home economics so that young girls don't know how to cook. And everyone has to go to a fast food restaurant or some other restaurant out there to power these American restaurants that are infested in our countries. Grow your own food. Cook your own food. Yes, it's bad for the economy, but fuck the economy because it's not our economy. So what if you cook out your own food? So what if you grow your own food? And what are we trying to do? Are we only trying to be employed and work for big corporations? Are we only trying to be obsessed with money? The whole point of making money is so we can eat. But if I can grow my own food and cook my own food, then I eat. You want money so I can go buy furniture, but why must I buy furniture if I have my own land? And I can grow my own trees and I can chop down my own trees and make my own furniture. If I can mine, I shouldn't have to get a mineral, a mining license from Gwede Mandashe. This is my land. It's my minerals. I want to take my iron ore and turn it into steel and create my own steel work. Why not? It's because they've been co-opted into this capitalist system, which feeds into the UK, feeds into America, feeds into Asia and Germany to enrich them while we are only good for being on a laptop, PowerPoint presentations, giving speeches like I'm doing now, but never fundamentally being able to manufacture our own cars, not being able to generate our own electricity, not being able to mine our own mineral resources, not being able to grow our own food, to educate our own children, to be healthy and to make our own clothing so we don't have to import from Asia for cheap and not have to buy secondhand thrown away goods that are imported and sold by foreigners here. Our country is a fucking mess. Our continent. There is no dignity. And your politicians will never give you dignity. And it comes through in these tragic stories like Tabo Pesta. And the rampant corruption. And Andre Tereita and the rampant corruption at ESCOM. It comes through in the, the Western Cape and the drug guys there. They didn't do well at school. They weren't athletes. But they also want to live in nice houses. So they go into drugs. In America there was the crack cocaine era. People that were selling cocaine. White rich people. Not too bad. Crack cocaine in the townships. Pumped in by wealthy white people. Huge heavy sentence. Same things happened here.
I find myself stuck in, should I try and help the masses who keep voting with their hands, voting at the ballots, voting with their labor for the same people that are oppressing them? Should I keep trying to educate and liberate them and tell them, go and farm, but I don't have land. You don't need land. You need a bucket, an ice cream container. But who's going to do that? Okay, please carry on. Tell people, send your child to an agricultural school. Send your child to learn, not just to play the piano, but teach them how to grow food. Send your child to the shooting range. No, guns are bad. Okay. Why are you not reading entertaining, uh, not entertaining educational books? Why are you not following my platforms for education? Why are you not learning how to run businesses? Why do you insist on social welfare, which is undignified? It's charity that numbs and destroys your brain. Why are you obsessed with booze? Oh, come on, we want to have a good time. Okay. Why are you smoking hubby? Ah, Faith, come on. Uti in Faith. Njalo, men, it's serious. Serious. Eu penwele, serious. Okay. Why are you not watching Bloomberg, CNBC? Why are you not watching National Geographic, the history channel, to learn how the real world works? Why are you obsessed with series that is mindless? So we mustn't have fun, Peno. We must always be serious and... Okay. And I get bashed on Twitter. And I get bashed on other platforms as a sellout. And as someone who's captured and I'm misleading the people. And I must tell my legal foreigner friends, or Rutendo, they must go back to Zimbabwe. Why do I give Zimbabweans a platform? Why do I give colonizers, Rob Hellsdorf, a platform? Why am I a part of Afri Forum, which is a racist organization? Um, why am I seen with a puppet, Untlantla Lax? Why am I seen with an ex-convict, Gaten McKenzie, is a criminal? I'm trying to educate you, I'm trying to school you, I'm trying to show you the real world, but I get bashed. And look, uh, in their credit, man, I have to thank everyone who supports what I do. Everyone who sends encouraging messages, DMs. Penal, keep going. Thank you for changing my life. I met a Jane Tutulani when I was at Zoo Lake, who started his own vegetable garden and he brought me his produce from the garden he started at Katle Hong. Saying, Penuel, it's a video I could to save my life. People that sent me DMs and said, Fetu, you, you woke me up and you told me no one's coming to give you a job. Go and create your own work. Start selling something. Use the internet. Get free Wi-Fi. Start writing books. Start making content. Go on to YouTube and learn how to garden. Learn how to fix cell phones. Learn how to do hair. Create your own job. Be your own boss. And at the end of the day, it's not just about money. And that's penalism. It's about value. Money is meant to get you the thing. But if you can get the thing, then you don't need the money. And if you and your community don't have the money, you can barter. I can teach your children maths if you can give me potatoes. I can teach your child how to play sports and become a super athlete if you can wash my car. We can barter and add value. But... Um, the reality of the state of this nation and the uncaringness of our politicians, people like Ufigil Mbalula, who literally take South African citizens for a boost on a daily basis on Twitter, people like Praveen Kordan, who believe they are beyond the reproach of citizens, people like Cyril Ramaphosa, who have no respect for us, and the rest of the ANC leadership, and the rest of the DA leadership, and the rest of the EFF leadership, who quote, famous things and laugh at each other and poke jokes but don't fundamentally work to uplift the people they claim to and they do these pr exercises and everyone's like oh look at my party my leadership and then you go back home to poverty and you go back home to an extended family that's broken and you're like ah mina ngamba ni eff eh mina ngamba fit no khongolo se mina ngiyinkatha nge umtshele okay guys you do not want freedom on the other hand, I can go and be a businessman and keep quiet like the rest of them and just make money. Live in a nice house, not educate and liberate anyone. Just create jobs, pay people the minimum I can, outsource the work to India, outsource the work to Vietnam, outsource the work to the Philippines, register a company in Singapore, you know, or the, the Isle of Man, um, and just make money. Because maybe that's how the real world works. Maybe we live in a jungle. And I'm the idiot. I'm the idiot that thinks the world can be better. The world has been like this. And the world will be like this. The lions will rule. The lions will get the farmers to fatten the sheep. And put them in a crawl. 
so that the sheep think that the farmer is their friend. And at the end of the day, the farmer will then pry the sheep and eat that mutton and that lamb. And then the, the lions themselves will have a pact with the farmers. You keep the sheep and eat the sheep. I will have the buck. And every now and then you must give me buck to eat. And these buck and these sheep will keep thinking that we're their friends. And it's fun because that's how the real world works. And people like Openuel who are coming to educate, the sheep will laugh at them. Who are you? Shut up. Go away. The buck will be like, you're stupid. We're in a protected game reserve. No one is going to eat us. And I'm the idiot. And it's sad. And um, I don't know what the future is. What I have been begging of the capitalists and the criminals is, guys, just be more sustainable in your approach. Don't, make, don't be too clumsy. If you're going to commit crimes, do them in a neat way. Why must you hijack and kill? Why must you hijack and kidnap? You want the car. Take the car. Make sure the person is out of the car and then take the car. And if it's possible, work with the insurance companies because that's what you guys do. And find out which cars are insured and take those cars. And then make sure that the people are safe. Why are you trafficking children? Why? Why are you trafficking children? Why are you serially raping people? Why are you running these prison systems that are all a money-making scheme and not about rehabilitation and not about fixing society? Why are you letting illegal immigrants come in so that rich, white and other people can exploit them in their restaurants, in their businesses and then turn a blind eye and say, we can't chase them back. It's a violation of human rights. No, it's because you exploit them and you don't want South Africans to be anything. You want them to be Social grant recipients with no brains who are plugged into escapism and drugs. The story of Tabo Besta is not the only story. There's, there's been a whole lot more before. There will be a whole lot more after. Um, the world we live in is, is a mess. And I'm hoping to find more people like myself, good people, that even when they do supposedly bad things, are, are considerate in the bad things. And understand, unfortunately, that at some point, if good people want a better world, they will need to be able to do the bad things that the bad people do. Your favorite Marvel heroes, Iron Man, Captain Man, uh, Captain Man, Captain America, the Black Panther, Black Widow, Captain Marvel, um, all of those supposed good people, Spider-Man, Hulk, they do bad things. They enact and enforce extreme violence. A lot of them are mass murderers. A lot of them, they break protocol from the United Nations, from their own country's constitutions, and they illegally enter certain countries. They kill people. They destroy infrastructure. But they believe they are doing good. From a different perspective, and this was the story of Thanos in Infinity War, from a different perspective, the Avengers are bad people because they these vigilantes that go into nations without passports and they cause havoc, but they say they are doing the right thing. If you look at the Gold Mafia documentary by Al Jazeera, which is exposing gold smuggling, you know, out of Zimbabwe to bring in foreign currency, they need to speak about why is Zimbabwe sanctioned? Why can Zimbabweans not freely trade their gold with the rest of the world? Which countries decided that Zimbabwe should be sanctioned and why? And those countries... Hashtag America. They built their wealth of slavery. No one has ever sanctioned them. If you look at the documentary 13th and the human rights violations they are enacting on American citizens, no one is sanctioning them. But they want to claim a moral high ground with Russia. The United Kingdom wants to claim a moral high ground with Russia. The Soviet Union has never colonized any nation. The Soviet Union does not have military bases around countries. They did not bomb nations and search for weapons of mass destruction and then after that go and set up bases around the oil reserves and the mining houses. Who gets to tell the story? Who gets to tell the story? That's the world we live in. But I'm saying if you're a good person, get guns. Learn how the law works. I was a bit disappointed listening to Oliver Metz speaking about how they're waiting to work uh, with the police services, with the investigators. Why? It's clear that these guys are corrupt and are involved with high government officials. 
Why do we still have this weird... I said this to Rotendo Matinyarari on the panel show at some point. I was like, you're still opening cases against the Americans and the Europeans that you yourself are claiming are the biggest criminals. South Africans still expect the courts, the chief justice, to enact justice in a country that is clear. If you are against Zuma and the Guptas, by now you should have seen that nothing is going to happen to Zuma and the Guptas. So you shouldn't believe in the court system. If you are pro-Zuma and against Sir Ramaphosa and the Ankole faction and his white funders, it should be clear to you now that there's no justice in this country and the courts are captured. If you are an ordinary citizen, you should see that both sides don't give a flying fuck about you. And you are on your own. So get weapons. Learn how the law works. Learn how to bend it. Learn to use it in your favor. If you have a bit of money, do the same thing that everyone else is doing and capture the politicians. Capture the big business people. Capture the courts so that they serve you and your people. And the big question is, who are your people? Cyril's people are not South African citizens. His people is his family, the Ramaphosas, his family, the Mutsipes. All his friends in government that work with him, all his business mates who work with him, those are his people and he serves them. When he says to Mamina, he's speaking to them, not to you. He's not serving you because there's still crime in your neighborhood. There are people being raped and killed and he doesn't care about that. You don't have a decent job. You don't have access to funding or a decent business. You cannot freely travel the world and be rich like him and his people. They are not your people. If you look at the Indian Muslims in this country who have run really good businesses, they don't care about you. You're just a consumer. They will not hire you. They will not invest in your communities. They serve their people. If you look at the white Jewish people in this country, they don't care about you. They care about white Jewish people and their business friends and some of the politicians they fund. Those are their people. If you look at white Afrikaners, if you look at AfriForum, which works for Afrikaners, largely white Afrikaners, those are their people. They don't care about the black masses in this country. That's not who they serve. That's not who funds them. You must go and fund the people that work for you. Does the IFP work for you? Is it eradicating poverty in your township? Is the EFF eradicating poverty in your township? Are they taking out drug dealers and drugs in your township? Are they building great roads? Are they ensuring that the businesses in your township are locally owned? Are they making sure that the tenders in your neighborhoods are tenders run by local people? Are they making sure that the schools are capacitated and the teachers are not drunk and the teachers show up to work? Are they making sure that tourists are not coming in and treating your township as if it's a zoo, coming to look at poverty and parade around while you guys benefit nothing? Who are your people? Who are your leaders? What are they doing for you and your people? Are you giving your money to them? Are you buying from their stores? Are you voting for them? Are you working for them? Because white Jews work for white Jewish businesses. They buy from white Jewish businesses. Indian Muslims work for Indian Muslim businesses. They buy from Indian Muslim businesses. White Afrikaners work for white Afrikaner businesses. They buy from white Afrikaner businesses. The foreigners that are here in this country, whether legal or illegal, Zimbabwean, Nigerian, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Somalian, they work for their own people. They buy from their own people. Black South Africans, black South Africans buy from Indian Muslims, white Afrikaners, white Jewish people, foreigners, illegal or illegal from Asia, from Africa. They work for Indian Muslims, white Jewish people, white Afrikaners, white English people, some of the foreigners, legal or illegal, black South Africans. You ask a black South African who to work for a black South African, they tell you there are no black South African businesses. They tell you black South Africans don't pay them well. They tell you black South Africans ill treat them. They tell you they'd rather go where they get paid the most. They will rather buy from a business that gives them the best value for money. They will go for value for money. They don't understand what they are doing. And they don't understand that that's the reason they are poor. And why their families are poor and broke and broken. I think I'll end it there. I've spoken enough. Anyways, I'm stuck in this dilemma of continuing to educate and uplift. And I think what I need to do is I need to be more aggressive in 
the people that believe in my education, besides watching, fund my initiatives. And let me make sure that in certain schools and spaces you're in, there are programs to teach your children how to grow their own food, how to fix their own cars, how to fix their own cell phones, and how to be uplifted. You know, let me do that for you. But you must send me money and resources and make sure you put me on platforms. And for the people that don't believe in me, I continue blocking them. And I continue not listening to them. And I build my brand of penalism. So that if someone says, Penal, who are your people? I say, it's penalists. And when someone asks, they say, who's your leader? They say, it's Penal. What has he done for you? He's made sure that I get good education. He's made sure that I know how to grow my own food, how to manufacture my own things, uh, how to make sure that I live a good life. So I listen to Cyril. I listen to Gaten McKenzie. I listen to Ian Cameron. I listen to Chris Papas. I listen to Tlantla Lux. I listen to Tutuzane Zuma. I listen to John Stianazen. I listen to Julius Malema. Um, I listen to, uh, I think, Ushabisa of the IFP. Um, I listen to anyone. But I realize those people are not currently serving me. Penel is serving me. And because of him, I have a better relationship with my, my family. I have a better relationship with my children. I live a healthier life. I rely less on, on processed medication. I understand the law. I understand politics. I've been able to travel the world. My family has got guns and we know how to defend ourselves. We live in a neighborhood that is protected and access controlled. And we are winning. Thanks to the work that Penal has, has given me. And get on these platforms and, and, and become rich myself. And say I'm rich because my people are rich. Like a pastor. Except your pastors are rich but you guys are poor. And say the reason I'm well off is because I've got a thousand, ten thousand people that follow me. They each give me a thousand rand per month, which is a million rand, ten million. What, what happens with Afri Forum? 310,000 paying members. So they raise over 45 million rand a month from people that believe in their cause and their agenda. And they are serving those people in real time. And those people can say, thanks to Afri Forum, my kids can go and learn skills at Soltech. Thanks to Afri Forum, I can get a job within that network of the members there. Thanks to Afri Forum, we have got neighborhood watch in our communities. Thanks to Afri Forum, certain things that are happening in the courts, they fight for us. If we don't like Julius Malim and the EFF, they take them to court. If we don't like what's happened with COVID and the lockdown, we take them to court. And just now they've won to have their costs uh, paid for what happened with the lo lockdown, claiming that it was unconstitutional. Those are people where you say Tuma Mina and they get Tuma by their people and their people send them money and it's not just lip service. Penal, I support you. How? How do you support me? Penal, help us. With what? With what money? I don't have. So I think I need to do more of that while I still have the energy, but I, I, I will not lie. My, my, my soul has taken a hit. The people that fundamentally need this the most are the people that resist this the most and prefer useless celebrities drowning in Amapiano, drowning in useless soapies, drowning in alcohol, drugs, weed, nyaupe. And maybe at some point we're going to have to come up with a very aggressive program for those people, forcing them to stay in contained spaces, forcing them might be a human rights violation, but again, good people doing bad things and will be judged by history, forcing them to work in spaces where they grow their own food and build their own houses, whether it's a mud hut, mud hut or a shack, but it will be their house built with their own hands, where they eat their own spinach and their own maize meal and they, they get their own eggs and their chicken from their own hands, forced because they clearly with free will, with biblical free will, with freedom, they are being reckless with it and they don't know what to do with it. And they are leading their own demise. And they are allowing the elite in South Africa, the elite around the world to continue oppressing and exploiting them. And maybe some of us who are good people have to force these people to do things that will uh, help them in the future. Perhaps. I've said before that we need human preservation farms where people live like we lived back in the day. Because they don't have money, they don't have education, so make them live in nature, forcefully so, until they've earned the right to get into capitalism. But until then, be like, we will contain you. Apartheid, segregationism, whatever you want to call it. But because you are living an undignified life where you are living in a squatter camp like ants, 
living like cockroaches and rats and dirt and filth. You're dirty. You're sick. Your brain is not working and you tend to crime and drugs. We will send you forcefully into these like game reserves for humans where you will be fed, but you will be forced to learn how to hunt and forage, how to farm, how to make things with your own hands. And once we can see that you now have dignity and you live in a good space of land and you're growing your own herbal organic medicines and you're growing your own food, we can then slowly reintroduce bartering amongst you guys and then start introducing trade so that if you have extra produce, if you have extra furniture and things, if you've been able to mine those spaces and you have commodities, we can then begin plowing you or planting you or plugging you into the mainstream economy. But on your terms, your dignified, healthy, mentally healthy terms where you went back to the origin and you found yourself again and you became powerful again and you learned how to get weapons and to defend what you have that is so precious, your land, your freedom, your dignity, your family, your belief systems, your education, your medication, your spirituality, your gods. That might be something worthwhile, but someone needs to fund myself, my fellow panelists to do this. Otherwise, we will isolate ourselves like the white Jews, like the Indian Muslims, or like the white Afrikaners, and we will live rich alone. And anyone who tries to break in will be called trespassers and the law will allow us to defend ourselves and to gun them down, to make sure they go to prison and to make sure that they get exploited out there. Tabo Besta. I'm going to drop a lot of the links to the things I spoke about. 13th documentary on Netflix, When They See Us on Netflix by Ava DuVernay. Um, I'm going to drop the link to the judges that were getting kickbacks to force kids into prison. Um, I'm going to post um, the link to the video for Newsroom Africa with Ground Up, uh, Ground Up's uh, Oliver Meth. Um, I'm going to post... Um, please go watch. I'm going to see if I can find a clip to the podcast and chill um, conversation with Mac G and Sol about the, the phone call from the prisoner. Um, or maybe maybe just post a link to the entire, to the entire episode. Um, I'm going to post some of the links to the Tabo Pesta story. The story is deeper than you think. Much deeper than you think. And there's so many people interwoven in this web. I can only imagine there's money laundering concerned. I can only imagine Cyril Ramaphosa and Palapala, there's money laundering there. And I'm sure he's not alone. If ever we had real investigative journalists, and ever we had real decent investigators in terms of cops and the like, you would see the insane filth we have with our politicians, high-ranking politicians, the insane fault we have with some of your most respected and celebrated business people in this country, some of the most popular pastors, your favorite kings and chiefs in this country, um, your favorite top celebrities, a lot of weird various scams and schemes and money laundering and money moving around and smuggling of things um, and turning off blind eyes and making sure that certain cases get dropped and evidence disappears etc 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 yeah man i think i'll stop my my story there today have a have a great and blessed day catch up with you guys soon and thank you so much to facebook for not disturbing this um stream and i'll try and to do i will try to do more of these because these were basically the things i used to do back in the day last year these 30 minute one hour one and a half hour rants of what's happening in our country and what you want to speak about one of the things I'm pushing on now is trying to re rebuild and fix families. Because if I can fix you as a guy, fix you as a lady, fix your romantic relationships, fix your relationships with your children, with your families, as difficult as it is. I know families, by a tag out, I know families hate each other. I know families kill each other. I know families are jealous of each other. I know families steal from each other. That is the hard work. That is the insanely hard work that you need to do. And if you can fix that work, it becomes so much easier to become like these groups that I've mentioned that are, are living well because you become a fortified union and no one can penetrate you. You have one religion, you have one culture, you guys have one vision and your family cannot be infiltrated. But it starts with you reaching out to your woman, reaching out to your, to your man, fixing things with your children, spending time with your children, fixing things with your parents, even if they traumatized you, fixing things with your extended family, even though you hate your aunt, you hate your uncle, Someone molested whoever, someone beat up. Try and fix those things. You won't get it right, but you will make some headway so that the next generation can do better work. Once you can fix your families, 
I promise you the world becomes your oyster. Some of the work I'm doing, the mothers of my children, the four mothers of my children, we communicate, we're trying to fix that, except for one I'm struggling with, which is documented, but I'm hoping at some point I'll get through to her, specifically through my son. I'm, I know how important it is to fix that. To speak through my children, I speak to my children on a regular basis. I spend time with them where I can. They can see that I love them, I'm with them. I want them to understand how the world works. I want them to understand the vision. I want them to have good relationships with me and their mom and our families and to not pick sides. I prefer my mom, I prefer, no. Even if me and their mom don't agree, they must still love their mother. Even if they don't agree with certain things, they must still love me because they must understand we are fighting external forces. They must have good relationships with themselves as siblings. They must have good relationships with their cousins, with their aunts and uncles, with their communities, and become leaders and tell people, guys, what's important is to fix us. And for me, I do consultations. You know, it's 300 rand for 30 minutes currently, but I realize I, I don't have much capacity and I'm going to have to create these spaces, paid for spaces, where I'm not getting trolls that come in and come talk shit and disrupt. People that pay money to come in and say, guys, how do we fix our families? How do we fix ourselves? How do we deal with the traumas and rewire our education? And then how do we build? How do we set up family trusts? How do we get land? How do we set up family businesses? How do we ensure that there's legacy projects, family trees that are documented, family gatherings, you know, and how do we plug into the rest of the world so that we build these fantastic families that people will speak about like myths in the future, like the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Medici's, you know, and um, some of the big families we have today, the Gates family, um, the, the Musk family, the families in Asia, the Japanese um, billionaire families, the Korean billionaire families, some of the, the uh, Ambani's in, in India, the Mittals, you know, the British royal family, of course, some of the families in, in, in Europe, you know, uh, Arno, um, some of those people there, the Dangotes, the Dantatas, um, Al Amudi, the Dos Santos, the Doji, the Mansours, as an example. How do we build these amazing families that get along where it's built on merit? You are seeing in action myself and my brother, Penson, pen and pen, showing the beauty of brotherhood. Not Cain and Abel, no. Penson and Penwell, showing you the beauty of brotherhood. We're, we're going to bring my sister in at some point, Penrose, showing the relation and the difficulties. Some of the things we're going to speak about, the fights we've had, the differences. You know, I speak about alcohol now. My brother and my sister drink. It's one of the things I don't like that they do, but I still love them. But they know how I feel about it, and they try to drink responsibly. They smoke hubbly. I judge them about it all the time. They enjoy it. But I tell them that this is the bullshit. We need to try to fix it. My brother's a gym freak, so he gyms better than me. My sister's beautiful. She's stunning, and she enjoys a softer life. And she's trying to tell us, don't just live a hard life, try and enjoy the beauty of life. But she works hard as well. She's trying to plug us into a different dimension. The world of females and how females see the things. So that we can teach her how men see things. And we can find each other somewhere. We're working with my mother. I'm trying to reach out to my half siblings. I'm trying to build with my cousins. Because this is the hard work. But I'm going to try and create these platforms where you guys can pay money. Come through. If you don't have money, there must be value. I believe in value. So I don't even need your money. If you're going to promote the events where we come through, if you're going to help market some of my businesses, um, if you're going to bring certain things, like Utulani came to Zulek, he didn't have meat, but he had his produce from his garden. Other people brought meat. Utulani ate the meat that people brought. We ate the vegetables and he has an amazing chili dish that he brought there. We ate his chili, you know, from his garden. That's value. Other people can come through and say, Pen, I don't have money, but... Anyone who's coming to the event, they can bring their children, I'll babysit the children. Anyone who's coming to the event, I can offer to wash their cars. Anyone who's coming to the event, I can offer my services in some way. Please bring me to the event. I want to fix myself. I want to have a stronger mind. I want to fix my family. That is the hard work that I've chosen to take on while I am commentating on society, on politics, on business. And while I keep having conversations, stimulating conversations with various people, while I keep... Um, Trying to get through. I would love to get through to Cyril Ramaphosa, Patrice Motsipe, Nikki and Jonathan Oppenheimer, Johan Rupert and his son. Um, I'd like to get through to Wendy Applebaum. Wendy Applebaum. I'd like to get through to Bridget uh, Motsipe. I'd like to get through to, I mean, Rob Hersoff has, has been an amazing mate. But some of the people that he knows, wealthy white people, wealthy Indian people in this country, wealthy 
colored people. People don't even know the rich colors in this country. It would be nice to showcase them so that we, I can get through to them and be like, guys, I said this when I said to the Vusi Tembegwai that new money is not well trained. These people need to understand that we are fighting bigger battles. We need to have 100, 500 year plans so that their own families can live in privilege into the future and are not dethroned because of clumsiness. The Zulu kingdom, I'd love to sit with Misuzu and explain to him, Misuzu, this is my frustration with you, your father and the royal family. And this is how I think you can do things better from a PR perspective, but also from a service perspective. Why does the Zulu kingdom not have an Afri forum, a Zulu forum? where ordinary Zulu people, they join the database and they put in a hundred rand a month. And the Zulu nation has been the biggest nation in this country, being outdone by the Bafo gang, the royal Bafo gang family. Get Zulus to put in a hundred rand a month. If you get 500,000 of them, that's 50 million, 50 million rand a month from the Zulus. And you take that money and you build Zulu libraries and you build Maskandi centers and you build these music centers where you teach Maskandi, where you teach Zulu heritage where you have Zulu manufacturing factories where they make Zulu attire that gets exported and bring in euro and yuan and yen and, and, and pounds and dollars. And you get Zulu storytelling and, and Zulu stories and you get Zulu television. You can do that with the technology. You can do that using social media. Have platforms where we're having conversations with different people from the Zulu kingdom. You do that with Tutalin Jebo, Emma Koseni. You do that with the vendor king. You do that with the kings and Pumalang. That is the work I want to get through to. But I will bash them because I speak truth to power and I'm not, I'm not scared. And people that say, ah, they want to take you out. Why? Why are you so scared of leaders that are not serving you? You are complicit in your own oppression. And I'm trying to liberate you. I'm telling you I'm God. Follow me. And I'm telling you, you have a God in you. Follow yourself. But it starts with empowering you, empowering your family, and getting through to these leaders and holding them to a higher account. EFM should have a fund. BLF Andil and Mutama should have a land fund that is going around buying land and giving it to the people and educating and upskilling them on how to work the land. But they are not doing that. They are here with me, making noise, being cool instead of serving. I'm not here to do that work. I'm not a politician. I'm not a businessman. I'm not promising you guys anything but education and mental liberation. And then over time, some of my friends in business, because I have a vast network, are going to be able to plug you into jobs, into skills, into resources, so that we can build better spaces. Not just in SA, but on the African continent, we have to infiltrate places like the DRC, the wealthiest nation on earth. We have to infiltrate Sudan. We have to infiltrate Nigeria, which is highly corrupt in itself. We have to work with Paul Kagame in Rwanda. We have to get closer to our North African brothers, some of them who don't see themselves as African, Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, and those type of areas, and then plug into the world and find good people and have good people that have a strong arm who are willing to crush bad people. Bad people are running rampant and we need good people to become much, much stronger. I've been speaking for too long. Have a great and blessed day. Cheers.